When looking at what the final record could be for South Carolina's football team in 2023, there is a wide range of possibilities. You are Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks Podcast. I'm Andrew Lyon, the host of this podcast, and you can find my written work over on Gamecocks Digest on SI.com. Thank y'all so much for making the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast your first watch or listen for your team every day. We are free and available both on YouTube and wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. And we've officially reached that point of the preseason. It is time for us to to look at South Carolina's schedule and see what is the best case scenario for this team. What's the worst case scenario? And what do we all think the final record is going to be for Shane Beamer and the Gamecocks in 2023? We're going to touch on all of that on this Thursday edition of Locked on Gamecocks. Let's start off with the positive side of the coin. Let's look at the best case scenario for the Gamecocks. Because in my opinion, the best case scenario for Shane Beamer in South Carolina this upcoming fall is a 10-2 record. Now, to break this down, let's take a look at the schedule first and foremost. In my opinion, we're going to know how this season is going to play out by week one four of the season and week four is the week that South Carolina takes on the Mississippi State Bulldogs and I believe that that game is going to take place on September the 23rd so by that point if South Carolina's best case scenario is playing out then the following things have probably happened South Carolina hasn't just defeated North Carolina they've blown them out maybe they blow out the Tar Heels by three scores or more. South Carolina is competitive against the Georgia Bulldogs in Athens. Let's say they don't let the Bulldogs run away with things like they did last season. Maybe the Gamecocks keep it a pretty tight ball game. Maybe the game even goes late into the third or even into the fourth quarter. I'd say that, honestly, that would be a win for South Carolina considering what has happened in that game over the past couple years. I know some of y'all might not like the idea of a moral victory there, but you got to remember that we're talking about the back-to-back national champs, and I just don't think South Carolina's there quite yet, even in the best-case scenario here. In the best-case scenario, South Carolina takes care of business against Mississippi State in Week 4, a game that maybe in previous years, especially before 2022, it probably would have been a little bit trickier even considering the circumstances surrounding the Bulldogs program right now. So, I think that by week four this season, all things considered, South Carolina would be 3-1 and one in a best-case scenario, and they will not just be competitive, but if they win, they are winning big in some of these games. Now, in terms of the on-field aspect, what all would have to happen for the best-case scenario to be realized for South Carolina? Well, the first fact we got to bring up is Spencer Rattler. In a best case scenario, Spencer Rattler is going to have the best season of his career. I personally think that the pairing of Spencer Rattler and Dal Loggins was a perfect marriage, and more importantly, it was the type of quarterback play call relationship that Spencer Rattler needed after what happened this past season, where He had to deal with long-winded play calls in terms of the verbiage that he was receiving from Marcus Satterfield. He had to deal with personnel groupings, a constant rotation of the guys that he had out wide. So, he probably wasn't able to build as good of a rapport with some of his targets as he would have liked. He was going from an air raid offense to a very comprehensive pro-style offense. And clearly, that hurt him in a negative way in 2022 things just feel differently this offseason I really feel like that this pairing of him and Dow Loggins is going to work out quite well for South Carolina this fall another aspect that I think would go 
the Gamecocks way in a best case scenario would be the rush defense. The rush defense would go from being one of the weaknesses of this team to maybe even being a strength of this team. I am very optimistic about this defensive front. I really like this linebacker core. I love the depth there. I love the versatility. I quite frankly feel like that some people are not talking about Debo Williams enough. I think that this guy is ready for the moment. I think he's ready to be a starter. I think Stoneplant is going to have a big leap in his sophomore year. The defensive tackle position, or the Travian Robertson, I think that unit is getting a lot better coaching in terms of the technical aspect of the defensive tackle spot. And the same deal with the linebacker position. That unit quite literally goes three deep at both spots. I think you've got five guys there with Tonka, Alex Boogie Huntley, Nick Barrett, TJ Sanders, and Xavier McLeod. Five guys right there you feel very comfortable with. And that doesn't even include Elijah Davis, who could also come on as the season progresses this fall. And then the edge position. I'm cautiously optimistic about Jordan Strawn's return. I think that he has looked good in fall camp, especially considering the fact that, you know, it was just 11, 12 months ago where he tore that ACL. Sometimes it takes guys a little bit longer, mentally speaking, but I think he's looked solid out there. Brian Thomas Jr., I really think that he's going to take a leap this season. From what he has done this offseason, the good weight that he has put on, he said he was 215 pounds when he played last season, when he was talking to the media, I believe, on Tuesday. That's ridiculous. He's now like 235, 240. So size-wise, he's going to be much better prepared for SEC play this fall. And he played phenomenal in the spring game. I think he's going to parlay that over into a really decent jump this season. Jatias Gear. Really good transfer from Syracuse. I think he's going to help this fall. And I just love the physical makeup of this secondary. Nick Evan Worry and DQ Smith are two physical specimens back there. Marcel Style, dude looks absolutely ripped when you see him, whether it's in photos or whether it's in person. O'Donnell Fortune, he has gotten better in the weight room off the field this offseason. And David Spaulding, he seems to be fully healthy once again. And continuing with the secondary, which I think would be another unit that would really do well in a best-case scenario here, this group, I understand they lost two cornerbacks in the NFL in Cam Smith and Darius Rush, but I think that these guys are going to be just fine. I think Torian Gray being one of the better secondary coaches, not just in the SEC, but quite frankly in the entire country, I think that he's got a great mixture of veterans and really young, talented players back there. You've obviously got Dial, Fortune, and Spalding in terms of the veterans. And then the young budding stars. You've got Emin Worry and DQ Smith at the safety spot. And then you've got some younger players like Jalon Kilgore, Keenan Nelson Jr., and Emery Floyd that could also help out this fall. Maybe even a Judge Collier or a Vakari Swain. That is a unit that is really starting to take shape in terms of solid overall depth at every single position. So if this team ends up going 10-2, and two, which I think is the best-case scenario in 2023. I think it's going to come down to the play of Spencer Rattler, rush defense being significantly improved this fall, and the secondary overcoming the losses of Darius Rush and Cam Smith and meshing together as a unit more so with all the talent they've got with their younger players and the experience and savviness of the older players. I think those would be the three spots to watch if this team is going to take another step forward on the field in 2023. Now, we talked about the best case scenario, but there is also a path to things going sideways for the Gamecocks this fall. And I'm going to discuss what that could possibly look like, both in terms of how some of these games play out and also how some of these guys perform on the field. We'll dive into that a little bit deeper in just a couple moments right here on Locked On Gamecocks. Today's show is brought to you by eBay Motors. Just like Spencer Ryler making pre-snap adjustments on offense, every part of your vehicle has to fit and work perfectly. So the next time you need maybe a new set of tires or a new pump or maybe you need a new spark plug, you can head on over to eBay Motors. With eBay Guaranteed Fit, you can make sure that every part you need fits just right the first time around. Just add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know how the part will fit, or you'll get your money back. 
And with over 122 million, not thousand, million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com eBay Guaranteed Fit is only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Welcome back to this Thursday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. Day. And as always, thank you to each and every one of you, every dares, for always tuning in right here on Locked On Gamecocks. We're going to finish our outlook for the season on tomorrow's show, a show in which I will use to dive into some of my boldest predictions for what I think is going to happen with the Gamecocks in 2023. So be sure to tune in for our Friday show in order to find out the boldest predictions that I have for the Gamecocks this fall. Now, let's get back to the worst-case scenario for South Carolina in 2023. In my opinion, the worst-case scenario for Shane Beamer and the Gamecocks is 6-6. Six and six. Now, when looking at the schedule, what are some of the things that might signal that a worst-case scenario is impending for this team this fall? Well, let's say the Gamecocks defeat North Carolina, because I still think either way, the Gamecocks are the better team in that matchup. But maybe South Carolina rides the struggle bus a little bit in their week one matchup. Maybe there's multiple turnovers committed by the offense. Maybe the defense can't even slow down Drake May. Maybe Drake May just throws the ball all over the yard despite having a new offensive coordinator and having some new weapons out wide. Maybe Georgia just cleans South Carolina's clock once again when the Gamecocks take on the Bulldogs in Athens in week three. And then maybe the following week, South Carolina manages to bounce back in terms of securing a win over Mississippi State, but maybe the game comes down to some plays late in the fourth quarter, which in my opinion would be pretty disappointing considering what all Mississippi State has got going on with their program right now. So that's the schedule aspect of the worst case scenario. Now, what exactly would have to happen on the field for the worst case scenario to take place for South Carolina. The first one that I think of is the offensive line. In a worst case scenario, the offensive line does not hold up for the Gamecocks. There is a reason why there's been several questions about this unit all offseason. Pretty much everybody that knows this team well enough, they have pointed to the offensive line as the unit that could make or break this season for South Carolina. I think that as time has passed, there are fewer and fewer questions as to how the relationship between Spencer Rattler and Dow Loggins will work out. I think there's fewer questions about how explosive this offense could be. And there might even be less questions about the running backs because to carry on Joyner, he seems like he has grabbed a stranglehold of that starting spot. DJ Braswell has apparently flashed in practice. Mario Anderson Jr., he could be a solid complimentary back that gives DK Joyner a reprieve when he needs it. But questions still remain about this offensive line. And I have to admit, it concerns me a little bit how all these players, when they're asked about the O-line, they talk about how everybody stands out. They talk about how gritty they are. They talk about their togetherness, how they've been intentional about hanging out with one another. And listen, I'm not saying that those factors aren't important here. But when I hear multiple players discuss these things over and over and over again, it's pretty clear what's going on. This is player speak. And potentially a way to mask what's actually going on. What reality is with this position unit. So we'll have to find out, of course, when the season kicks off. But if things go sideways, if this season goes off the rails, very likely the offensive line is going to be at the forefront of the problems here for the Gamecocks. Now, another aspect that would maybe go awry in a worst case scenario here would be pass rush. Maybe pass rush is not existent this fall. Maybe we've underestimated the losses of Gilbert Edmond and Jordan Birch. I know everybody likes to bring up the low sack tolls that Jordan Birch had in his career here. There's no disputing that for certain. But Jordan Birch did bring an athletic burst off of the edge that few other guys did on this roster. And he also did do a good job of pressuring the quarterback at times in certain games, especially late last year. Gilbert Edmund was a savvy and smart 
edge defender on the other side of him. Maybe Jordan Strachan doesn't fully bounce back from his torn ACL. Maybe he's just doing good right now because he's not having to go 110% against guys that he doesn't know very well in practice or on the field, I should say. And I think that the edge position unit could definitely help in rush defense. I kind of alluded to that earlier, but who can provide that burst? If it's not Jordan Strachan, you know, is it a Brian Thomas Jr.? It'd be hard, in my opinion, for him to go from, you know, being a guy that rarely saw the field last year to all of a sudden, he's like one of the biggest contributors at that spot. What about Desmond Mayo Zulu? Is he a guy that maybe the coaching staff would need a bigger contribution from than they expected heading into this season? There is a path in which this does take place. I think that there's plenty of bodies there. I think that there's certainly pieces there. But there are not a lot of proven commodities, especially in terms of guys that have played in this conference, not the ACC, where we can all agree the talent level is just not that great overall. The SEC is a different animal. So, in a worst case scenario, maybe pass rush does not step up to the plate when needed. And then the last factor that could possibly take place in a worst case scenario that I could think of is maybe this freshman class, as touted as they have been this offseason, maybe they don't provide the boost that we thought they would. Beamer has talked a lot about relying on some of these young guys this upcoming season, but what if the majority of them just aren't ready for those kind of roles yet? Whether it's mental or physical. I think that we can all confidently say that Grayson Pup Powered is going to be a factor this fall. Jalen Kilgore is going to be a factor. DJ Braswell running back. Maybe Lenore Sellers gets certain packages at quarterback. I think he should. I think you would all agree with that. But what about everybody else? What if Nick Harper's adjustment is a lot tougher than we realize? Maybe he doesn't even make a hidden impact at wide receiver this fall. What if some of the young DBs and O-linemen need more time to develop? Whether, again, it's maybe just getting in shape, maybe reshaping their bodies, or it's just diving into the playbook and getting the verbiage and communication aspect down. There's a reason why it is difficult for a lot of true freshmen to burst onto the scene in the SEC. And I know some of you are going to immediately say, well, Nick, I've been wearing DQ Smith did it last fall, and I don't think any of us saw that coming. So why can't it happen with a bunch of these guys? Maybe it does. Again, this is just a worst-case scenario playing out here. And if it does end up being a 6-6 six and six type year, maybe the freshman class, again, I don't want to say doesn't live up to the billing because that wouldn't be fair, but maybe there's just not as many instant impact type players. That could certainly happen. So maybe the freshman class not living up to their expectation for this season, pass rushing being non-existent, and... The offensive line just struggling mightily. Those would be the three things I would look at in terms of a worst case scenario if this season were to completely go sideways for South Carolina. All right. Now, in a couple moments, I will dive into my official record prediction for the Gamecocks this fall. What do I think is going to happen with this team? This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Now, in the past few days, there are a lot of kids that are enrolling into college and they're about to start their first year ever away from home. And for some of these kids, maybe the process has been smooth and seamless. Maybe you couldn't wait to get away from your parents. But maybe there's also some other kids out there that are struggling in this new environment, trying to figure out how they're going to adapt and evolve in this new world that they're living in. And maybe you've reached a point where maybe you feel like that you need to get some therapy. And if you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient and flexible, and you can suit it to your own class schedule. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash LockedOnCollege today to get 10% off of your first month. That's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P dot com slash Locked On College. Welcome back to today's edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your team every single day in just 30 minutes. All right, it's time to get into my official prediction for South Carolina's football team 
in 2023. I thought that I had a final record that I was set on for a couple months, actually, but I recently have been going back and forth and I actually changed my prediction. I originally was thinking six and six because I just feel like that this team has got a lot of issues in terms of the trenches, but I changed my prediction to seven and five. Now, some of the rationale behind my prediction, I already explained it to y'all a little bit, but the offensive line unit, I just have a lot of concerns with that group. And while I think that this offense is still going to be improved in terms of the passing game this year, it is fair to question just how often is the running game not just going to be there for South Carolina, but be there consistently in some of these football games. And that leads me to the schedule. This schedule is just absolutely brutal. The Gamecocks are facing five top 25 teams based on the preseason AP and USA Today coaches polls that have been released in the past couple of weeks. Their road slate is just ridiculous. They play at Georgia. They play at Tennessee. They play at Texas A&M. And they also do play at Missouri, but Ferret Field, we, none of us respect that as a home field environment in the SEC. But Texas A&M, Tennessee, and Georgia, I took the average of each of those three stadiums and their top capacity. The average capacity of each of those venues is like 99,000. That's pretty tough for a team that this upcoming season has made no bones about it that they're going to be relying on a lot of younger players, including some true freshmen. Now, breaking down this schedule into a couple different stretches, there's going to be a few that are going to decide how well this team does this year. The first one's obviously the month of September, where you got games against North Carolina, at Georgia, and at Tennessee. I still feel like that South Carolina is a better team right now than North Carolina. I think they're much more stable than Mississippi State right now. They've got home field against Mississippi State, and there's no real schedule dynamic advantage that either team has. I just think South Carolina is better than the Bulldogs on the west side of the SEC. Now, in terms of the Bulldogs on the eastern side in Georgia, South Carolina's just not ready yet. They're getting better. The Gamecocks are compiling more talent. But they do not have the hosses in the trenches yet to go up against Georgia for 60 straight minutes. I just don't think that they're quite there yet. Give South Carolina another recruiting class or two, and I think that they'll be able to challenge Georgia on a serious level. But right now, they're just not ready. The game at Tennessee, honestly, in terms of all the quote-unquote tougher games, this is the one game where you could convince me South Carolina could win. I still give Tennessee the nod here, but not by much. I think that that is going to be, either way, a close ball game. But I do think from a personnel standpoint that South Carolina can match up with Tennessee a lot better than most of the other teams in this conference. I think South Carolina's got the secondary to slow down that passing attack. And I think that South Carolina, as long as they stay healthy, has the weapons on the edge, the tight ends, and the quarterback to just absolutely torch that defense again. 63 points necessarily, I'm not going to go that far. But 38 plus, I could see that. I could definitely see that. The next stretch is the stretch of games against Florida and then the two road games at Missouri and at Texas A&M. Now, in terms of the overall firepower, maybe that stretch does not pop off the page to some of you, but I think that is a tough stretch because of the emotional and revenge game aspects that all three of these games are going to provide. South Carolina is going to be hyper-emotional in the Florida and Missouri games. Those are two big revenge games. And I really am curious to see if South Carolina, let's say, goes into that Florida game and they get their revenge against the Gators, how do they then respond when they take on Missouri the following week? Do they come in a little bit overconfident, maybe kind of overlooking them like some might argue they've done over the past couple of years? Or does South Carolina calm down after their win over Florida, mentally reset, and approach the Missouri game in a businesslike manner? I want to say that they'll do the latter. But again, this is a younger team this year, at least in terms of the guys 
that you're expecting to contribute. I think that if they're going to bounce back from a potential revenge game victory over Florida and then beat Missouri, you need number seven to lead the charge there. I'm just not fully convinced of that. I think that Missouri's defense is stout. I think they have no issues making it an ugly type of football game and making it come down to the fourth quarter per se. Missouri's got home field advantage. I think that one's just going to be tough. At Texas A&M, I think the Aggies are going to be a much improved team this year. I think that offense is going to be a lot better. Their defense is just full of studs in the defensive front and in the secondary. And it's at Kyle Field. And they're going to want revenge. And they're coming off a bye week. The Aggies, I think, are going to get that one. Jacksonville State and Vanderbilt, I think the Gamecocks get both of those games. The Kentucky-Clemson game, I hate those two games are slotted back-to-back for the Gamecocks. But I think they're going to get at least one of those two games. I just don't think South Carolina is going to lose both to Kentucky and to Clemson. Not when they got home field advantage for both those contests. And I think that if there's a game that you can point to and say special teams is going to win them that football game, Kentucky and Clemson are two of the three games where that could possibly happen. So, that is my overall prediction for the team this year. 7-5. and five. I think that they will go bowling. I do think they finally take a step back, but I think it's a very minor step backwards. And I think that they will be competitive in the majority of these games outside of, say, Georgia. Again, they're not ready to compete with the Bulldogs yet. 2025, at that point, might be a different conversation. But with that said, that does it for today's edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. I hope that y'all thoroughly enjoyed today's show, as always. What are your guesses for the best case scenario, the worst case scenario, and your final overall record for South Carolina in 2023? Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments section on YouTube, or shoot me a direct message on Twitter at A-Line underscore SC if you listen to today's show on an audio podcast app. As always, thank y'all so much for tuning in. Have a great rest of your Thursday, and I'll be sure to catch y'all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast.